Stradenta Meets Rick Jensen Early Influences Well, my first love was heavy metal, Guns N' Roses and Black Sabbath, and then eventually into, you know, all the classic stuff, Slayer and Metallica and all that. But at the same time, starting to listen to bands like Sonic Youth and Nirvana. Sonic Youth are a great band anyway, but they're especially good because they were always promoting things that they liked. So you suddenly discover Japanese noise music, discover bands from New Zealand that I didn't even know about, discovering things like free jazz and that. You know, I'm a big jazz fan, but I went the other way from listening to like really extreme free jazz. And then also with my two friends, as one of us would get a record and share it with the others. So we were constantly swapping records and I bought this, check it out. Because the thing is in New Zealand, pre-internet, we had to order everything from overseas. So you couldn't listen to it in advance. There was nowhere online to go and check out a track. So you had to just take a chance with ordering something really expensive from another country and hope that it turned out to be a good record. Music projects. Did vocals uh, originally because I couldn't play any instruments. And then I took up playing guitar and that's kind of when things started seriously. My two best friends at high school, we started our first proper band, which was called Negative A. And it was two guitars and drums and we're doing really noisy stuff. And it was all songs. Uh, but uh, I went to see Tony Conrad perform in New Zealand and it was about 1996 I think and it, it totally changed my life, it blew my mind, I was like wow, fuck the songs, I'm just going to do experimental music now. And so that band developed, we eventually changed the name to Nova Scotia. We released a bunch of CDs and records and stuff on different labels. And then we'd all moved from our hometown in Hamilton to Wellington. And Wellington was kind of the cultural capital as well as the actual capital of New Zealand. So we met lots of other musicians who were playing free jazz and playing folk music. And I discovered the saxophone. And so I went and bought a saxophone when I was 19. And then started some different bands. I started my first kind of free jazz band. And then, uh, I met my ex-wife uh, in New Zealand and then we eventually moved over to the UK uh, which is kind of when things got a bit more started for me. When I got here I didn't have any bands so I started going out meeting people and I had a project called the Insect Explosion and it was kind of I guess heavy industrial. Ended up having quite a few different albums out on different labels sort of cassette releases and some crazy guy and California puts out a copy of 20 cassettes or whatever, you know, that kind of a thing. And then um, I, I stopped making music for about, I guess about two years, two and a half years at one point because of personal reasons. And then I decided to get back into it. And that's when I started what became the Apocalypse Jazz Unit. And I started my solo electronic project, The Neurologist. I play saxophone in Apocalypse Jazz Unit. I guess there's probably eight or nine members who are very regular who play at most of the gigs. Then there's a few people who play here and there. And then if we're playing a gig and there's a musician with a trumpet or a saxophone or whatever, I just tell them to come and join us if they want to. And then the only urologist is more electroacoustic, so it's using effects pedals. And it's also kind of a video project, so I made a lot of films to go with live performances and stuff like that as well. I play saxophone into uh, rock bands. One's called MGF, which is a very heavy noise rock kind of band. Then I'm in a band called uh, Nuha Ruby Ra, who's the singer, it's her solo project, but I play saxophone for her band. I had a band called Fat Cop, which was an improvised grindcore band where I played guitar. I also have an ongoing project which is myself and Nuno Vega and it's kind of a performance dance project where he plays a character called Fontello and we also collaborated with another sound artist called Jose Macabra. We played at the Dronica Festival in a big church, it was great, it was the kind of environment that that, that project should be in. The only other significant thing I've got is a band called um, Cojones Spirituales and the idea was to have a harmonica based drone orchestra. 
but then we recently decided we'd done enough with harmonicas, so we're moving on and adding different things. Skronk events. The origins of Skronk, I guess, kind of go quite far back. When I first moved to the UK in about 2006, and I was living in Sussex at the time, I used to go to Brighton quite a lot, and there was a group there called Safe House, which was an improvisation night, happened once a month or twice a month. And I thought that was a, a really cool thing. And then when I moved to London, and I met John Russell, who runs the Mopo Moso, and he does this Christmas event every year. On that day, there might be 60 or 70 musicians show up, and he puts together small ensembles to go and play. So I had done those, and then when I started Apocalypse Jazz Unit, we were doing some gigs at 100 Years Gallery, and through those gigs, there might be eight or nine members of the band, but we would do small groups. So there might be three of us do a set, and then another three, and then we'd do a whole group thing together. So I really like doing that kind of lots of small combinations on one, one night. Then um, I went to New River Studios, and I spoke to the managers. So there was uh, Tom and Marion. Uh, Tom since moved on from, from working there, but I said to him, shall we do an improv night? could do like a monthly acoustic improv night in the cafe. And he went, yeah, great, great, let's do that. I get there on the night and he's like, actually, we're gonna do it in the live room. So you've got a PA system and a drum kit and amps if you want. I was like, fuck it, all right. And he ended up having a really good turnout. Quite a few people came. And Tom said, uh, why don't we do it twice a month? Cool, all right. So suddenly it became twice a month. And the idea of Skronk was that it's a free improv open mic and musicians would show up and I would put together combinations of whoever I chose and they'd play a five minute set and then they would go off stage and I'd choose the next group and so on. And then every event there would be a feature performer who would do a half an hour set. So I continued doing those for a few months. I did the first Skronk Fest and it was quite ambitious but it was really successful, packed out the whole venue in two rooms for the day. So that kind of encouraged me to carry on. And then one of the other things that happened quite a lot was there was a lot of people coming doing electronic music, they were bringing synthesizers or um, just their pedal set up or whatever electronic stuff. And I thought, well, actually there's enough of these people that we could just do a whole night of just electronic stuff. So I started Squonktronic, which, <clears throat> Off the top of my head, I think that started in early 2017. And so then that became a monthly uh, electronic bass night. Originally, it was also supposed to be improvised, but very quickly I changed that and just accepted anything electronic. And around the same time, I did the first Skronk dance event because I'd always been a really big fan of sort of contemporary dance and movement performance. It was easily the most successful Skronk event. There was a huge amount of people came. And those happen every three or four months, I guess. And uh, the other one was I did Skronk Speak, which was a spoken word, text-based experimental music night. And they were also very successful, but that's probably gonna be occasional rather than a monthly thing. I'm not 100% sure, but I think the name originates from kind of like rock and roll guitar players. And then the word Skronk kind of got taken by free jazz, loud saxophone players. And when I was trying to come up with a name for the event, I didn't want it to be something boring like New River Open Mike Improv Night. Jeff Cheesemaster from Brighton suggested the Skronk Sessions. And then Tom Blackburn, who was from New River Studio, said, why don't we just use Skronk? And I said, Skronk, that's great. It's short, it's simple. People will remember it. It's something to ask as well, like what does it mean? Skronk's become known as a place where anything goes with a few rules, but uh, it's a format for people to experiment in all sorts of ways. You can try something and it might not work very well and that's okay, you know. And then the other side of Skronk that's been really good is uh, lots of people have met other musicians and formed bands and regular projects because they've done something with someone at Skronk, which for me is, a, is one of the best rewards because I've introduced some people who've then gone and started their own project. And also it's sort of a label. Um, I have zero interest in running record labels, but all of the open 
mic recordings get put out on Bandcamp uh, so the musicians can at least go and listen to themselves and go, hey, here's my first ever live performance or whatever. Future. I realised that I can't continue promoting Skronk in the same way. I'm a musician first. I'm kind of a promoter by accident. <laughs> so I'll keep the two improv nights per month because that's the kind of, I guess, the flagship night of Skronk. But things like Skronktronic might become less regular than a month and I might do a few a year. Personally, otherwise, lots of gigs going on. Social media. If you want to get involved in Skronk, the best way is via the Facebook group. There's a Twitter profile, and through there it's just to send me a message via that. There's an email, skronkimprov at gmail.com. I always try to respond to messages really quickly. 